Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back. We, uh, hi, John. We've got Manny Pacheco again. How Manny, you, how, where did you come from? How did we get so lucky today? I... <laughs> Celebr and Matty got the big box, too. The yeah. yeah, I do. The Celebrating Act 2 universe. That's where I came from. I, yeah. I just well, popped right in. That's it. <laughs> uh, we love you uh, and really appreciate you being a regular contributor to Celebrating Act 2 because I think everybody loves movies. Um, Hollywood is ingrained in American culture. You're a Hollywood historian. Um, and one of the, you know, the other night I was watching, as I often do, flip through uh, old videos, and I saw the Dick Cavett show. I don't know, what is that, 40 years old, 50 years old? Something like that. Dick yeah. Cavett was interviewing Bet uh, Betty Davis. Uh, Betty Davis, thank you, Bet Davis. And I was fascinated. It was a great interview. And what I was fascinated by is a moment in the interview where she said to Dick Cavett, that uh, because she was she was a big studio star, big studio property in the for, days for, of, for Warner Brothers, right? For Warner Brothers, and she was one of the first to kind of break that studio system and and demand more money or not work for them, and really kind of go out and and the studio system soon ended, collapsed after that. She said that she never would have gone independent, if you will. If Jack Warner had simply come up to her once, once during that career at Warner Brothers and said, Bet, you were terrific, loved you in your last movie. And, and she said, the way she said it was, you know, it was all about, she felt like a serf. Mm -hmm. She felt used and she felt uh, uh, she had no control. All she wanted was a little love. Well, the movie moguls had a real tight grip on Hollywood and, and its stars. I, I had the honor of interviewing uh, Debbie Reynolds before she passed on. And Debbie told me that the problem was is that they had what they call a layoff clause in the contracts of the, of the stars, meaning that if you didn't work for some reason, you turned down a, an opportunity to work on a, on a script, the amount of time that they would work on that film, let's say six months, would be tacked on to the end of your contract. Meaning that you you basically that contract would never end. You couldn't renegotiate until it ended. And so renegotiation was basically off the table. And you pretty much had to accept any part that was offered, no matter how pedestrian. And that was frustrating for Betty Davis. And it was particularly frustrating for Olivia de Havilland. And Olivia de Havilland uh, was so uh, demonstrative in her fight against Warner Brothers because as much as she loved playing opposite Errol Flynn, which she did 14 times or nine times or something like that, she wanted more meteor roles, uh, in part because her ego didn't like the fact that her sister Joan Fontaine had just won an Academy Award before her. And, and she just wanted to just, you know, she felt she was a good actress and she wanted to show off. And um, she went all the way uh, to courts to fight uh, for the rights of actors. And the courts ruled in her favor in what is known as the de Havilland Clause. And what in effect this did was give more independence to the actors. And that would soon uh, eventually allow the actors to form their own movie studios, uh, pick out their own scripts, and then the demise of the studio era followed. So I would say uh, one of the first, uh, actually the two of the first actors that, that stepped away from, um, from the studios to start making independent productions, Montgomery Clift and then Robert Redford. And, and Robert Redford took an awful chance because he was not well known at the time. This wasn't the Robert Redford we know. I mean, Montgomery Clift, when he did it, he was a pretty big star. Robert Redford was not a big star, and they refer to this now as the indie films movement, and it and it caused the it caused the studios to collapse. And by 1967, it, they were just going to be a, a shell of their former selves. So uh, yeah. when 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 the um, <clears throat> without getting into some specifics, which I'd like to in a moment, uh, in between during that collapse, as as things were being reformed. Um, from the studio system itself, were there pieces of it that uh, 
are missed that have made for the film, at least for a period of time, if not forever, uh, uh, in a negative way? What are the negative things, consequences uh, of it collapsing? Well, look, they shouldn't have had the iron fist on the stars. But that said, these were these were studios that would train you to act. They give you diction. They would teach you to dance. They would teach you to sing. They had uh, they would they would provide education for their youngsters that were uh, on the studio sets. They molded and shaped with uh, with the help of uh, publicists your your whole career. And when that went away, uh oh, I've just uh, there I am. <laughs> but with, with that said. When that went away, you know, actors had to fend for themselves. I mean, think of the think of uh, Ricardo Montalban with diction le lessons, or Peter Lawford learning to dance. I mean, this really established great personas on screen that I think are sorely, sorely missed. I think that these these films, these black and white films, and then later color films. I mean, uh, how wonderful they are, and could they have been made without the aid of the studios? Uh, uh, machinery backing you. I mean, and that that was formidable, very formidable. Yeah, and and of course the studios, also, they were factories. They they were film factories. So they turned out B movies as well as A movies. Right. And they used the B movie, you know, even as a kid, we would go to the movies and there was a feature, and there was a second feature, yeah. which I didn't know was a B. There was what a the second. When the studio Feature. system went away, the, the, the sure. B-movies went away. But let me tell and, you... The, and that training ground of a B-movie went away. Yeah, and, and you make a really good point because one studio was still kind of thriving by the time that the, um, the movie studios were, were going away, and that was 20th Century Fox. But then they turned around and decided that in, in, in a way to fight uh, television, in a way to try to establish themselves, knowing that independent movies were small, they started making these really big epic films that spent a lot of money, and then the yeah. film would flop, and that would kill 20th Century Fox. Yeah, Notably, yeah. the two films that did them in, Cleopatra, yeah. where... Elizabeth Taylor received an ungodly amount of money uh, before you know a, a word is spoken. I mean, they're already in the red heavily just because of Elizabeth Taylor. She she says she just put out a, a figure just so that she didn't have to play Cleopatra, and they they said yes. <laughs> and she got the part. <laughs> that she could refuse. Yeah, she just couldn't refuse because it was just an ungodly sum of money. But. It didn't do that well in the box office. It, it ran, what, almost four hours long, so you couldn't even distribute it to for it to run many times in the theaters. And it really destroyed the, the career of Joe Mankiewicz because he went so far over budget, nobody would ever hire him again to be a director or wow. even a producer. So that that was a that was kind of a bad thing. But the but the real death knell came with the making in 1967 of Dr. Doolittle. Now think about this. I, I just want you to think about this. 1967, a bellwether of great, gritty, independent films, uh, like in the heat of the night. I mean, yeah. just one of these fabulous, fabulous films. Sure. And the he, height of social unrest in the 60s, yeah. The, there was the a lot Bonnie of great Clyde, films in the 60s. Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate. Yeah. Yeah. And even even a more uh, lighthearted film, but 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 had a big social message. Guess who's coming to dinner? Mm -hmm. All of these wonderful films were up against 20th Century's Fox's Doctor Doolittle. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. As you might expect, Doctor Doolittle just couldn't compete with these new uh, these new films that were being made, and that pretty much spelled the end of the studio era. Well, I know that they're probably uh, somewhat different times. But could you um, maybe remark a little bit about United Artists and uh, uh, Corman? Uh, separate, oh, yeah. separate, separate topics, but they were certainly uh, beginning to fill the gaps of uh, the studio system. Well, uh, United, yeah, United Artists, my gosh. I mean, how many great films, I mean, that came out of United Artists? One that comes to mind was that great uh, Jack Lemon Lee Remick film about uh, the, the, the struggle against alcoholism. Days yeah. of Days of Wine and Roses, that is one of the great United Artists films. But there were so many of them. Birdman of Alcatraz was another. I mean, there were so many wonderful, uh, gritty, 
uh, well-told stories that were now being uh, um, endorsed by major actors like Jack Lemmon, Shirley MacLaine, Paul Newman, Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas. I mean, they were they were coming out with some very, very wonderful collaborative efforts, and that was going to hurt. Um, that was definitely going to hurt uh, the, the, the movie studios. An uh, early early um, departures uh, of folks that formed their own studios. Humphrey Bogart was one of those folks that, if you see the movies of Humphrey Bogart of the 1930s and the 1940s with Warner Brothers, and then you see Humphrey Bogart in the 1950s, you're seeing a different bogey, and you're seeing him do some really amazing work. It was in the 1950s he won his Academy Award for The African Queen, which is an independent production. Uh, really? Out of his studio. The Cane Mutiny was another. Beat the Devil. Even his last film, The Harder They Fall, it's just a different bogey. Sabrina, just a totally different bogey than the tough guy image that you saw in the 1940s. Interesting. Interesting. And that was because he was basically producing his own films. His and you know, you see, his, you see a pattern company. here too. Bogey left Warner Brothers. Olivia de Havilland fought Warner Brothers. Betty Davis argued with Jack Warner. The pattern is, is that Warner Brothers might have been the most egregious, but they weren't alone. I mean, if you look at Columbia Studios and what the way they treated the Three Stooges, for much of their career, the Three Stooges thought they were you know, they were just serviceable actors that didn't merit a full feature. That's why they made it so many two reelers. But in fact, they had such a cult following that was kept from them by Harry Cohn and Columbia Pictures. I mean, the studios, if they had just treated their actors better, maybe they would have survived. But it was just it was just uh, it was just a, a problem that was coming to a head. And it finally it finally buckled. The, the studio here. Now, one other thing would hurt the studios as well, and that was the emergence of television. And it wasn't television itself that destroyed the studio era. It was the response by the studios to television, making these big budget movies of the 1950s and 60s. Now, it worked in the 1950s. Great films, you know, in right, Vista right. Vision and Panavision and, right. you know, Cinerama and all of that. That worked really great for a time. But you make a big budget picture, a big epic film, three hours long, and it becomes a flop like Cleopatra or Doctor Doolittle. It's it could one film could destroy a studio, and in fact, two films destroy 20th Century Fox. So yeah. I got that little bit of the sequencing then. So the studio system was there. They built it. They had these great assets of backlots and props and training and PR, and but but all the abuses they had of uh, controlling the stars and the career. But they well, were also, not only the actors, but the writers as well. Right. Yeah. And so they were able to churn out uh, both good and B-movies, if you will. And then with the, the, the Haviland uh, 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 decision, uh, things went to the point where people started doing independent movies. Actors broke away, such as United Artists. Uh, and then you, you had the B-movies, which weren't getting made anymore by the studios because they, were, they didn't have enough people. So then you had guys like Roger Corman, okay, who was brilliant to himself because he actually created a lot of stars by taking chances on a lot of people. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, folks like him and, and, and others would, uh, would also create uh, stars in their own right. I mean, uh, Jack Nicholson worked for Roger Corman, uh, Dennis Hopper, worked for Roger Corman. So, you know, he was also developing new talent for the future as well. And uh, basically he was replacing the studio system in the development of, of, of future uh, generations of actors. Yeah, Ron, Har uh, Ron Howard, I think one of his, uh, uh, he gave a chance to direct uh, early on. So now we have the state of the system today is there is no Hollywood system, although there are still studios. And they make deals with a lot of independents, so yes. they've begun to adapt, and they have TV divisions, so on and so forth. So what would you say is the, okay, Granny, I want to make a movie. What do I do besides take out my, my cell phone, okay? If, if I knew the answer to that in depth, 
I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. <laughs> I'd be busy making a movie. But that said, you know, you you got to still raise the capital. You have yeah. to act as your own producer. In some cases, you have to be the writer and the director. The good news, the studio systems do kind of skeletally exist to be able to dis distribute the finished product. Uh -huh. So they're there for distribution purposes, Universal, MGM, uh, in name only, because MGM really doesn't exist as a studio anymore. Um, Warner Brothers, um, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, although now 20th Century Fox is owned by Disney. So it, I don't know that we're going to see that 20th Century Fox banner at the beginning of films anymore. We might, but I, I'm not sure about that. We'll see. We'll see what Disney does with that. I know that they've already changed uh, their their uh, the, the way the logo works. They, I think they're not calling it 20th Century Pictures because for some reason they're taking the name Fox out of it. Sure. So anyway, well, you know, one, ahead, one of the things that the studios did is they became, uh, besides concentrating on the financial uh, aspect of making pictures, um, they really. <laughs> The, the distribution and the finance, they really concentrate on, on raising money and make partnerships. Um, so they're not, they don't finance, a, no studio today finances a, stu a film 100%. They lay it off. It's like betting in Las Vegas. You lay off half of your bets uh, and cover your downside. Um, and so Hollywood is still the only place where you can make these huge, huge films. Uh, with big stars and big budgets and special effects uh, because they've got the system for the money, really, more than anything else. Let me let me offer this, too. What The way it is today has uh, allowed a kind of a united artist concept for today's young filmmaker, only they have more avenues to present their, their, their more platforms, I guess, to present their product. And that is uh, through streaming and through things like YouTube and Hulu and all of the like. So uh, we're, we're still seeing some great content, smaller, shorter films that you can yep. see. And I think a great example of that would be the movie Whiplash. Remember that wonderful movie from a couple of years ago? Yeah. Uh, Damien Chazelle, a uh, great director. Uh, he, yes. Th it started as a real small platform oriented idea that then turned into a short film and then was uh, actually then worked upon and created and expanded into a feature film that won multiple Oscars. So, I mean, there is a road, but I think today's filmmaker has to just be more creative because you don't have the guides. The studio system acted as your guide to make these one. They had, they had all the resources. Now you have to be very creative in, in the way you, you uh, develop your resources. And yep. in some cases, they're very good stories. Whiplash is one of the best outcomes that, to come of that. You know, and then you have to also depend on these wonderful film festivals like Sundance or uh, the Tribeca Film Festival uh, that Robert De Niro runs in, in New York. There, there, there's these wonderful film festivals that help you get, of course, the Cannes Film Festival as well, Toronto Film Festival. There's plenty of them where you can really generate a buzz once the product is is finished but yeah. that's that's the rub you got to get the product finished the yep. the, production mu the production must be completed once yeah. that happens then the machinery goes back into motion yeah well it's a, it's a, an interesting historical look at uh, movie making and uh, I, yeah, today definitely... movie movie companies are really media companies but yeah. today but today in this session we've sort of had the cliff notes of the demise of the, the, the studio system. And it seems that, Manny, this is probably a great subject matter for like a, one of your 15, 16 week uh, college courses that you teach. Oh, I do talk about them. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't offer cliff notes. They have to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I do. This is one of those stories I, I, we do love to tell, no, no doubt about it, because I think it's important for today's uh, young broadcaster filmmaker to understand that they really hold a lot of power in their careers and shaping their brand. So absolutely art. Well, I'd like well that. I'd I, like... It, I think it's good for everybody to know because again, I'll call it cultural importance. You know, uh, the output of Hollywood is our, is a, 
a great deal of our culture, of American culture. Mm -hmm. It reflects the times, it reflects our history, it reflects uh, various opinions, among other things. So it's important stuff to, to have an appreciation for. Well, we've Absolutely. come to that point in, the, in this episode uh, for shameless plugs. Uh, first, first shameless plug of the uh, of, uh, of the end game here is uh, you can binge watch Manny's Forgotten Hollywood series on Celebrating Act Two by going to youtube.com forward slash Celebrating Act Two, the number two at the end of it, and you can binge watch him and see some of the other really great uh, 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 contributors that we have, regular contributors, as well as uh, we're getting these uh, interesting little one-off uh, conversations with people who are doing interesting things. And Manny, uh, let's go to your shameless plug. Where can they find uh, more information about the great, the great Manny Pacheco? Well, I mean, you can read my blogs at uh, ForgottenHollywood.com. Of course, I've got three books, Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, Son of Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, and Road to Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History. And they can be they can be acquired how? Oh, through Amazon, and you know that's probably the easiest way. But we we uh, we invite you to to be part of the Forgotten Hollywood franchise. Great. Uh, so, and you're Great. also working on a new book now, are you not? Yes, with my sister of all of all people. Uh, mm -hmm. She uh, she's actually gone to my website, re read every single blog I've ever written. Uh, two, two, over 2,100 blogs, ooh. and she, she's picked out a little bit over 100 of the, of the best blogs, and we're going to uh, distribute it, and not yet, but, but we do have a working title. It's called Forgotten Hollywood, Beware of the Blog. <laughs> well, apparently, your sister has found out something to do during the quarantine. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, anyway, this Manny, has been another, thank you so much. another delightful conversation, uh, as always. Uh, thank you, Manny. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.